Now, our summer series, uh, Disciplines of Grace, you heard Tom talk about that a moment ago. Disciplines and grace, those aren't two words we typically put together. Uh, if you were here last week, you heard Pastor Brian talk about the discipline of gratitude, and how many of you took the gratitude challenge? Anybody? Two of you? Good for you? Great. The challenge was, in case you missed it, you can do it this week, is that you wake up every morning and you make a gratitude list, five things you're grateful to God for, and you can't repeat those throughout the week. Very simple thing, but we so easily lose sight of all that we've been given in God's grace, and we focus on what we think we lack. And it's a good thing. It's good for your soul to start the day by just listing out some things you're grateful for. But if you think about those words, disciplines and grace, we don't connect those naturally in our minds. Because discipline sounds like physical discipline, training, punishment even. It's harsh. Grace is nice. It's freedom and joy and liberation. It sounds nice. But disciplines of grace, how do those go together? The Bible actually puts them together in a very profound way in the life of a believer. You saw the verse that was listed in the intro little video there that in Titus, the Apostle Paul writes in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 12, he says, the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all people and it trains us. And the word for training is the word paideia. In Greek, it means like discipline a child, educate a child. So the grace of God has appeared and forgives our sin, brings salvation, and it also disciplines us, trains us, changes us. To what? To renounce ungodliness and to live self-controlled, godly lives in this present age. Meaning, God's grace doesn't just forgive your sin once upon a time. It has an ongoing disciplining, training, transforming effect on our lives if we engage with it. So the disciplines of grace are just those activities, those practices that Christians engage in and have engaged in throughout the centuries to do what? To live in the stream of God's grace, to walk in his grace, to experience more of his grace. And as I said last week, Pastor Brian talked to us about the fundamental discipline of gratitude, to be grateful people. It takes work because we have this stream of selfishness and ungratefulness running through our own hearts. The discipline of grace we're going to explore from the Word of God this morning is the discipline of noticing. You might call it the practice of paying attention to the work of God in your life. It's not as easy as it might sound, because most of us, if we're honest, we're not paying attention, or if we are paying attention, we're paying attention to the wrong things. Uh, Recently, I took a trip to the United Kingdom, the UK, with my wife. We went with a group of pastors that I've been a part of in this three-year kind of cohort. We a couple times a year, just the pastors would meet on location and learn from other churches. It's been very good for me uh, in my work and in my role. But this was the sort of the finale, the last hurrah. We were going to go to the United Kingdom, learn from a church in London, and then go spend a couple of days with a man named N.T. Wright, the preeminent New Testament scholar alive today. For nerds like me, this was really cool. And to make it even more awesome, my wife got to join us with the other pastor's wives, and we tucked in a day in the middle of this trip to go to Oxford and see all the C.S. Lewis sites. It was so <laughs> awesome. I can't even tell you. (laughs) Anyway, the last day, we were there an extra day uh, because of our travel arrangements, and we were in St. Andrews, Scotland, where N.T. Wright is a professor of New Testament. And we, instead of doing the theological stuff, we were going to do some outdoor fun hiking. My wife likes to hike, and I like my wife. And so we were going to go hiking. (laughs) And we, she wanted to hike in the, the East Lomond Hills. The, the Lomond Hills are the foothills of the highlands near Loch, Lake Loch Lomond. Well, that's redundant. Loch means lake. Anyway, anyway. that's a picture of where we hiked up to that, that rise there. It doesn't look like much from here. That's really a long ways away. And it's like a 1,500-foot elevation gain. And it was beautiful. And we started hiking. You'll see another picture here of it in the distance. Uh, and the mist is there. It's very Scottish. I'm just having a... It's really fun. And I'm cruising for the first half an hour. I pass by these three ladies with their dog. My wife's up ahead. And I'm marching, you know. And then about an hour later, we're still ascending, and I'm dying. And my head is pounding. I'm wheezing. I'm bent over with my hands. And, my going, <sighs> and those three, those same three ladies with their dog pass me by, and one of them says, "It's a great morning for a hike, lad." I'm like, I was like, <clears throat> I didn't think Christian thoughts toward her in that moment, you know. I can barely see my wife. She's way ahead, you know, I'm walking, and I'm not having fun anymore at all. In fact, I'm thinking about quitting. I'm looking for a side trail. I'll meet her on the other side, but it was just straight up. And anyway, you'll see a picture here of me, like, don't I look like I'm having fun? Like, it's <laughs> the last ascent. She's like, she's out there going, come on, Jeff, it's beautiful. I'm like, Duh. So we finally get to the top, and here's a picture of us at the top taking a picture. I look like I'm smiling. That's actually a wince. <laughs> looking down at the hillside below. And when I got to the top, I really was really tired, not feeling great at all. And my wife was like, 
Jeff, look how beautiful. The mist was burning off. You could see the town of Falkland, this little beautiful Scottish village and the ruined castle and palace down below. Look, look, look. I, I don't want to look. I don't want to notice. I just want to stand there and breathe and recover, you know. And so it, it became a metaphor for me. And I think many of us go through life that way. Just head down trying to get through. Not pay attention. Don't even want to pay attention. Don't notice. Just we're tired, we're fatigued, we're worn out, we're distracted, whatever the case, we're just trying to go, make it. And we don't see the beauty all around us. This is a picture on the way down. I like that view <laughs> for many reasons. Um, then, then the last one here of us looking back up at what we'd accomplished was a, is a, was a good, uh, good image as well, the next one there. Well, there is one. There was one? There's not one. That's the last view. Anyway, we, uh, I, I noticed things on the way down. I didn't notice on the way up. Here's my point. The discipline of noticing, because we live in a distracted culture, we are distracted people. We don't see. How many, it's Father's Day. How many of you dads think your kids have attention span issues? Yeah. How many of you kids think your dad has attention span issues? Right? When, when, when Benjamin, who was a high school graduate, was a little boy, he would tell these stories that were part fiction, part reality. I couldn't follow them. I would lose, lose interest. And I would like look over his shoulder at the game that was on, you know? And he would grab my face and turn my face toward, Dad, Dad, and tell me the story. I think in many ways God's trying to get our attention that way. The Bible actually has quite a bit to say about the discipline of paying attention and noticing his activity. In fact, the best place to go to learn about the discipline of noticing is in the book of Psalms. And we're going to look at one psalm, in particular, Psalm 19. You can turn there with me. It'll be familiar to many of you. Even if you don't know it by heart, you'll recognize many of the words, I would imagine. And if it's new to you, this is uh, the, the psalm that C.S. Lewis called the greatest poem in all the Scripture. And I think he's right. It's a psalm written by a man named David. David was Israel's greatest king. You might know him because he killed Goliath famously with the stone. Before he was king in the palace, he was a shepherd with sheep, which meant he slept outside under the stars a lot. And shepherds, by, by necessity, get pretty good at noticing things. They keep watch. They, spend a lot, they have a lot of time on their hands. And all of that noticing and paying attention made its way into David's spiritual poetry, which we call the Psalms today, which speak to our souls. And this psalm in particular is about how God speaks to us. The first third of the psalm is about how God speaks to us in the created world. And that's what we're going to read. Verse 1, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. It's rising from the ends of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. David, again writing this, staring up at the sky, you can just see him in the wilderness, mountains of, in and around Judea, pondering, thinking. What is the world saying to us? David begins his magnificent poem by telling us that God is continually speaking to us through what God has made. God is trying to get your attention, friends. Always, not now and then, every day, every moment, every night, day after day, night after night, the psalmist David says, it, the created world is pouring out speech. And it's not just located in one place. Some of us think that, you know, I can hear God, see God, notice God better in this place. Do you have places like that in your life where you feel closer to God? Those are helpful, but it's not true that God is more present there than he is right now, right here. Or when you go to work tomorrow. He's always everywhere speaking, pouring out speech. And there's no part of the world where the, his, this language is not understood and heard. The heavens are declaring things. The earth is proclaiming something. The reason that creation is declaring the glory of God is because God made it that way. He intends it that way. Everything God makes, every rock, every tree, every stone, pebble, grain of sand, wave on the ocean, everything that God made, he infuses with his glory and he intends for it to declare something about who he is. And that includes you and me. Elizabeth Elliot said once famously in These Strange Ashes, a little book she wrote, that a clam glorifies God better than you. 
Because a clam is existing according to its created design where you and I have a choice in the matter and we don't always do that. The point is we're surrounded by things God made that are telling us about his existence, his character, and his nature. And most of us are not paying attention most of the time. We're not listening. We're not noticing. Think of it this way. Why should a sunset, have you ever seen a sunset, I mean, I mean a beautiful sunset painted in the sky that just takes your breath away? Who's, anybody seen one of those ever in your life? If your hand's not up, you need to get out more, people, right? <laughs> Why should it thrill our hearts if the sun is just a ball of burning gases 93 million miles away? It might be interesting, but why should it thrill us? Uh, how many of you looked up at the night sky when you're away from the lights of the city and the suburbs on a cloudless night when it's so clear and you just, the stars are like just so brilliant? Anybody ever seen one of those night skies? Why should that make you ponder the meaning of life if they exist in a meaningless, cold, dark expanse called the universe? David says, because that's not true. God made them and he's speaking to you through them. Are you listening? Do you notice? Are you paying attention? The Apostle Paul expands on this in Romans chapter 1. He wrote Romans, this great theological letter with this soaring this theological description and exploration of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And the preamble, chapter 1 versus the middle of chapter 2, really, he lays the foundation for the gospel. And listen to what he says in chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. This is really profound. He says, for what can be known about God is plain to them, meaning all people, because God has shown it to us, to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, we, are without excuse. It's not as if God has put very hard to decipher clues in the universe. He's making it plain. Day after day, night after night, he is saying clearly what? His eternal power, divine nature, on display. And yet, many, many people miss. How many of you have had this experience? You've seen something beautiful in nature. Sunset, sunrise, birth of a child, mountaintop view, something that just took your breath away. And you thought, how could people see this, what I'm seeing, and not believe in God? Have you ever thought that? Maybe you were once that person. Maybe you are right now. The Bible is saying, God is everywhere speaking to us. But the world's full of people who aren't listening and aren't paying attention and don't notice. Those of us who claim to know him and follow him, we need to pay attention. We need to notice. Humans have a remarkable capacity for missing the point. We're really good at it. Jesus said to his own disciples, right after he does his miracle of feeding 4,000 people, they worry about bread for the future. <laughs> Think of the irony. And Jesus says, what's the matter with you? No, he does, that's my translation. What he says is, are you still hard of heart? Do you not understand? You have eyes, but you don't see. You have ears, but you don't hear. Don't you get it? Don't you know who I am? C.S. Lewis uh, writes in his book, Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. He says, we may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with him. He walks everywhere incognito. And this incognito is not hard to penetrate, Lewis says. The real labor is to pay attention, to come awake, he says, still more to remain awake. I like that phrase, to remain awake. I think you could make the argument that coming to Jesus and receiving the grace that forgives sin and then our job in the Christian life is to remain awake to the presence and power and work of God in our lives because we fall back asleep. How, how many of you have these parents, who's had this experience? Your, your kids say to you, mom, dad, wake me up at seven. I have to go to work at whatever time. Okay, you say, I'll get you up. I, I downstairs drinking coffee, my espresso machine reading my book, and I hear my son's or daughter's alarm clock going off. I go upstairs, and I wake him up. My wife says things like, good morning, sunshine, rise and shine, it's a beautiful day. I say, get up, you have to go to work, you know, whatever. And they get up, and they look at me, I'm up, Dad. They throw the covers off, they swing their legs on the ground, the lights are on, they're up. And I walk out of the room, what happens? Boom. <laughs> right, you know, right back to sleep. I think spiritually speaking, we do this. 
We have moments where God speaks to us and we get it. We come awake to his reality. We recognize, oh, God is real. He's working. He's with me. I'm not alone. And then not much time goes by and we're back to sleepwalking through life. We just, we like the spiritual snooze button, if you will. We forget. We stop noticing and stop paying attention. Too many of us, myself included, aren't noticing. Paying attention leads to noticing. Annie Diller wrote a book called Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. It's a spiritual diary of her, uh, um, it's a record of her life. In her backyard, there's this creek running through called Tinker Creek, and she records her attempts to notice and pay attention to the goodness of God and the smallest detail of creation in her own backyard. And there's this part of the book where she's talking about a friend of her family whose daughter had a, 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 a ocular disease, and she was going blind, and they had to do surgery, and then she was covered up with bandages, and when they took the bandages off, she could see again, and the girl's reaction to her newfound sight was, became for Annie Dillard a motivation to see God. Here's what she writes. She says, it's all a matter of keeping my eyes opened to a teeming living world all around, but most miss it completely. When her doctor took her bandages off and led her into the garden, this precious girl, who was no longer blind, saw what she called the tree with lights in it. It was for this tree that I began to search through the peach orchards of summer, in the forests of fall, and down winter and spring for years. Then one day, I was walking along Tinker Creek and thinking of nothing at all, and I saw the tree with lights in it. I saw the backyard cedar where the morning doves roost and charged, transfigured each cell of that tree a buzzing with flame. I stood on the grass with the lights in it, the grass that was wholly a fire, utterly focused, transfixed. The flood of fire slowly abated, but I'm still spending the power. Gradually, the lights went out in that tree, and the colors died and disappeared. But I was still ringing. I had been my whole life a bell and never knew it until the Lord picked me up and rung me. Isn't that good? We have these moments where we wake up. The trick is to, to remain awake. We hear about the woke movement in our culture. I think that's an imperfect cultural attempt at talking about what matters to God, racial reconciliation. But there's a greater awakening that needs to happen in our hearts before that one can happen. And that's waking up to the presence and power of God all day, every day. All around us. What's always going on. Now, the important thing is not just to notice, but to make it that a connection in our noticing and to begin to praise the God who made that thing. Elizabeth Barrett, Barrett Browning in her great sonnet writes, Earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush of fire with God, but only the ones who see take off their shoes. The rest of us sit around picking blackberries. And noticing leads to praising. So pay attention to noticing. Noticing leads to praising. In Psalm 8, David, the same one who wrote Psalm 19, he says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your hands, the sun and moon and stars which you put in place, he says, I ask a question. You know the question? What is man? How many of you ever looked at a nice guy and thought, I'm so small and insignificant, right? What is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? And he answers it saying, you made me. You crowned me with glory and honor. And then he finishes the psalm the way he begins it. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Paying attention leads to noticing, and noticing leads to praising. Praising the God who made it. The important thing is not just to see good things, but to praise God in them. I, I recently got together with some friends of mine from college. I played football with them, and we lived together in a house, and we had a kind of a reunion up at a place called Priest Lake, Idaho. Uh, it's way up near the Canadian border, snow-capped peaks, glacier-fed lake, gorgeous place. The Pacific Northwest, where I've not been much, is just stunningly beautiful. And we, and we would do a lot of fun things, and I went on a hike each morning. And I, this one morning I got up, and I went on a hike, and I forgot my phone. I don't know if you know this, but it's possible, and even preferable, to go hiking without your phone. I didn't have my earphones in, and I didn't have my phone with me. And I'm noticing things that I would not have otherwise noticed. I was walking, I heard the sound, like a brrrr. I'm like, is that a jackhammer? I'm in the middle of nowhere, Idaho, in the woods. What is going on? I came around a corner, and there was a woodpecker. I'm not making, as long as my arm, just hammering away at a tree. And really close to me. Woodpecker looked at me like, what's your problem? And I went back to brrrr on that tree. I was amazing. And I, I kept walking, and I heard like a sound of a stick crack in the woods. And I froze. And I thought, is that a bear? 
If it's a bear, how big a bear? Can I take this bear? I don't know. And then I heard, saw movement in the trees. And ahead of me, I saw a moose pass by like 40 yards ahead. A moose! I saw a moose, everybody, on the trail, right? If I had my headphones in, I'd probably walk into that moose, or he tramples me. I probably couldn't take the moose. It's not just to see cool things. It's to praise the God who made them. Now, I'm going to guess that some of you who are, uh, who are natural, you're naturalists, you're ascetics, you like the natural world, you experience God in creation, this is speaking your language. You love this stuff. But there are probably others of you who are more the engineer types, the analytical types, the practical types. You're going, I don't want to be a tree hugger, Pastor Jeff. What is this? Just tell me the five things I'm supposed to do today. Just give me the treatment. This is actually a very practical and important discipline for all Christ followers. We need it. In fact, Jesus actually applies the discipline of noticing to a very common human issue, the issue of fear and worry. How many of you, at one time or other in your life, have ever worried about the future? Show of hands. <laughs> if your hand's not up, you're not listening to me or you're totally lying, right? <laughs> You may not be a, pro, a person given prone, prone to worry or anxiety, but all of us know what it's like to be nervous about the future. My kid's future, my family's future, the economic future, the political future. We get stressed about these things. We worry, what's going to happen? Is it all going to work out? Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, his great sermon, this was a collection of his teachings about what it means to live life in the kingdom, talks about this. And listen to what he says. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 33. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say if some of you made an appointment to come see me or one of our staff for pastoral counseling because you were racked with fear of the future. You came to my office and said, Pastor Jeff, I'm stressed about the future. I don't know what to do. Can you help me? And I said to you, here's what you do. Go outside, look at some birds, and pick some flowers. I'm going to guess you would walk out of my office going, now I'm worried about him, right? You would think, that's not what I came for. That doesn't make any sense. That's not very helpful. But it's what Jesus tells us to do. But he's not talking about mindless bird watching and flower picking. He's telling us to do something specific. The word look and the word consider. Look at the birds and consider the lilies. Those two words. The word look is the word to st for stare intently. The word in, for uh, consider is the word for contemplate or think deeply. Stare intently, think deeply. About what? About how these simple things, like birds and flowers, connect you to God. Tell you something about your life in the care of God. Julian of Norwich wrote a series of uh, revelations, divine revelations, lessons God taught her. She lived during the mid-1300s. She lived, as a child, she lived during the time of the, of the Black Death. More than a third of her family would have been wiped out from this disease in her own village. She also lived during the period we call the Hundred Years' War, the great war between England and France. Saw many people butchered and killed, even innocent people in this war. She had more reasons than we have to question the future and the goodness of God. And one of her famous revelations, the first revelation in this book she wrote, is about a hazelnut. Anybody know this one? I try to find a hazelnut, but they're, apparently don't, we don't sell them in the States because they're gross. But <laughs> they're, they're, this little hazelnut she has in her hand, I'm going to read to you what she writes. This he showed me, and it's the smallest thing, a hazelnut lying in the palm of my hand. And it was as tiny as any pebble. I looked upon it with the eye of my own human understanding, and I marveled how it could be, and how could it last. And I was answered. It lasts, and it ever shall last, 
for God loves it. And so have all things that are beginning by the love of God. In this little thing, I saw three properties that have sustained me all my life. The first is that God made it. The second is that God loves it. And the third is that God keeps it. Do you hear that? It sounds so simple. She's looking at a hazelnut, a small, insignificant, how many of you have just walked past acorns on the ground and don't even give them a thought, right? And in the smallest, most insignificant thing, she sees three divine truths that sustain her. God made it. God loves it. And God keeps it. What does Jesus say when he says, look at the birds of the air? Consider the lilies of the field. Notice, he says, I'm teaching you in the created order itself. I made you. I love you. I keep you. Are you worried about somebody? God made them. God loves them. God will keep them. I'm not saying there aren't good reasons to be fearful at times and to bring those fears to God in prayer and to plead for his intercession to him to do something. I'm also saying that for many of us, we have our heads down going through life, and every now and then we look up and we see a little bit of glimpse, and God is saying, pay attention. The God who made you, who loves you, and who even now keeps you. Do you ever around somebody who lives like this? How many of you get around somebody who's filled with worry and anxiety and you think, that's what I want to be like when I grow up? <laughs> but if you're around somebody who's, who notices God in, in life in ways that you miss, it's inspiring, isn't it? I was walking out of a C.S. Lewis lecture at Wheaton College with Jerry Root. Jerry preached here last year. You might know, remember Jerry, the, my friend with the beard who tried to pick me up. He actually did pick me up. Uh, anyway, that's not part of the story. We're walking out of the parking lot, and I want to talk to him about why I think this lecture was not very good. And he grabs my arm. I'm in mid-sentence and goes, oh! I, I, it scared me. I'm like, what? And he points up at the hill, Blanchard Hill, where the, 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 the kind of the iconic building at Wheaton College is there, and the sun is setting. It's a fall day. It wasn't even that great a sunset. I mean, I've seen better sunsets. And he goes, isn't it glorious? And he's not put on airs. It's just the two of us. I'm like, yeah, it's okay. And he goes, Jeff, that we should be given the gift to see such a thing and the ability to see it. Praise God. And I was like, are you okay, Jerry? <laughs> and he wasn't pretending. But I did think, I want to be like that. I want to be like that. I want to be the kind of person who notices and who praises and who sees. And I don't often enough. Maybe you don't either. Why? So that I could live in the grace of God. So it can spill out of my life on other people's lives. So I'm not racked by fear and anxiety and worry. So I see people the way God sees them. I don't treat them as objects or as utilitarian tools to be used for my agenda. I want to live different. That begins with paying attention, by noticing, by praising. And praising leads to perspective and to peace. That's what Jesus is telling us. Praising leads to perspective and to peace. It is not a waste of your time to practice the discipline of noticing. So last week, your challenge was to get up every morning and begin your day with gratitude. You should keep doing that. That's a good thing for your whole life. This week, you have a new challenge. Your challenge is, should you choose to accept it, to end your day by taking a little inventory of where you saw God. If you're a journaler, keep journaling. If you're not, I would encourage you to put a little piece of paper by your nightstand or your bed before you head into the pillow. Just take a moment and pause and think, where did I see God today? Maybe it'll be in something your kids did. Maybe it'll be in, in a random interaction with a person who encouraged you in some way. Maybe it'll be in nature, a song on the radio. It could be anything. But I bet the act of asking yourself that question every night will teach you to pay attention during the day in different ways will help, help you stop sleepwalking through life. That you would see and trust the God who made you, the God who loves you, and the God who keeps you. Let's pray. Father God, you, this is your world. It's your, our Father's world. You made it. You love it, and you are keeping it even now. We are being held together by your grace and love and mercy. 
Forgive us for having our heads down and being so blind to your activity, to the things that you're declaring and proclaiming and saying and doing all the time. Pray that by your spirit this week you'd wake us up, that we might see, notice you, and learn more about you. Thank you that you made us, that you love us, and that you keep us. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.